Imagine you could step inside the minds of Canada's healthcare leaders, glimpse their greatest fears, strongest drivers, and what makes them tick. Welcome to Healthcare Changemakers, a podcast where we talk to leaders about the joys and challenges of driving change and working with partners to create the safest healthcare system. Hey listeners, thanks for hitting play. We really appreciate you listening. It's Philip here from Hiroc. And Abby, and we're tag teaming on today's episode. Artificial intelligence. These two words likely strike up an emotion in you. But it doesn't have to be all that scary. And that's exactly how we felt after we chatted with Dr. Devin Singh, who is an emergency physician at the Hospital for Sick Children, and one of Canada's first physicians to specialize in clinical artificial intelligence. Devin is also the co-founder of Hero AI. Our conversation with him touched on many aspects, such as the critical importance of patient safety, problem solving, capturing a variety of voices when co-designing, and how he values continuous learning. And for those startup entrepreneurs listening, Devin also shares a number of great tips of things to consider when mapping your innovation journey. We also appreciated his points on clear communication. It truly can shift perspective when everyone is on the same page. So let's get started. We're so delighted to have you with us. Join us today, Devin. Um, How are you doing? Yeah, really great. It's an absolute pleasure to be here talking to you, Philip and Abby. Uh, Really excited to dive into things uh, with the two of you. Excellent. So let's get right to it then, Devin. Um, Tell our listeners a bit about yourself, where you work, and what you do. Yeah, so uh, my name is Devin. Uh, I'm an emergency doctor from Sick Kids Hospital, um, and I, I strictly practice emergency medicine there. A uh, bit about myself. So I did my pediatric residency training and my uh, emergency medicine subspecialty training uh, at the Hospital for Sick Kids at the University of Toronto. And then I actually added on um, a clinical uh, fellowship in AI. It was something that I just invented at the time because it didn't exist. Um, and really the motivating factor for doing that was just working in the health system and seeing a lot of inefficiencies, but also having some really tough patient cases where I've seen patient harm, um, just felt that we needed to think through creative ways on how we change the way we deliver care to our patients and discovered that machine learning could be a really great avenue for doing that. And uh, I did this extra one year of um, clinical machine learning and then formalized that with a master's in computer science at the University of Toronto, uh, working under these giants such as, you know, um, Dr. Mike Brudno uh, and Dr. Anna Goldenberg, who were my mentors um, then and still to this day. And so now I um, specialize in emergency medicine for pediatrics, but also in um, clinical artificial intelligence with a real bend around clinical automation and, and building machine learning tools and integrating them into real world clinical workflows. Uh, And actually, just it was in that journey that we were building these really amazing algorithms, but quite frankly, there was no way to deploy them. And so I could write a paper on it, which is great, I guess, but that's not why I went into it, right? So uh, in order to deploy the tools, we recognized that there was no um, agile platform built for healthcare to do this. So this is where Hero AI uh, was born, which is a healthcare technology company that I co-founded and am the CEO of in partnership with SickKids. And um, this company is really focused on getting these really powerful tools directly into the hands of patients and healthcare providers. That's amazing. And so I guess um, you've done quite a bit and you've worked with some amazing people. Um, and so I guess a, a kind of question that popped into my brain is like, oh, how did you just like, uh, how did you get everything off the ground and just, you know, create the, create Hero AI? Like, w- or did you have any um, barriers or did you feel, oh, I can't do this with my, you know, full-time job? You know what? Um Lots of barriers because this was a net new technology, right? Yeah. But I was just going to start off like I was going to say, like you know what? Like a real strong motivator is having that clinician perspective, and quite frankly, seeing um, at times uh, the way care is delivered, uh, especially when a health system is strained and overwhelmed, and looking at how hard our nurses are working and our physicians, and and we're trying so hard with um, what we have in our health system to deliver outstanding care. And we do that really proudly at SickKids. But just thinking like there's got to be a better way to improve this um, was a really strong motivator. And so despite there being a lot of barriers, I've always held that and, and a few patient cases really close to my heart um, when trying to break through the barriers that we're talking about. And, and And quite frankly, there were lots of barriers. Like how do you 
um, approve an AI technology to deploy and go live at your hospital? And then how do you think through the data governance, the privacy, the security, and the way data flows? Um, how do you put in like the quality and the safety parameters in place to know that the AI models that you're going to deploy uh, into a real-time workflow are actually safe now, but also remain safe as they're deployed? How are you going to monitor the way that these machine learning models are performing prospectively and ongoing so that you know that safety from a patient perspective and quality is actually maintained. There was like, that's just the tip of the iceberg of a lot of the things (laughs) we had to think through. And then there's also these concepts around like, um, you know, we're bringing together uh, an entity, Hero AI, with sick kids. How do we think through ownership? How do we think through IP? How do we think through not only deployment at the hospital, but then um, scale across multiple sites across the country and internationally? These were all things that we had to tackle. And I'm just so blessed um, that sick kids was willing to take this on. Like these are hard questions to mm. tackle. And and as an institution, rather than shying away, sick kids said you know what, this is important. Let's figure it out. It didn't happen in a month though. Let me yeah. tell you, there was a, there was a lot of meetings <laughs> that, that had to occur, but they, but they were willing to do it. That list you just, you rhymed off. I know just off the cuff now, that's like a, like a, you just provide, you basically just created a nice uh, framework for, um, you know, startups, uh, you know, who want to do, who want to start up something, follow this checklist from Devin and you know, you'll be on your way. So that was, <laughs> so that was fantastic. Thanks you for sharing that. And I also appreciate that you brought in the the points about your personal perspective and the lens of your of your colleagues um, throughout the whole organization at SickKids, not just you, you, you didn't just emphasize one particular audience. And I really appreciate you mentioned that as well, because everyone is involved in care um, at your organization and all, and all health care organizations at that. Absolutely. Like to derive impact from any type of technology deployed, it actually has very little to do with the technology. And it truly is all of the people uh, surrounding that technology to bring it to life. And and that's why it was really important to think through like what are the real barriers to improving care, um, both at our institution, but beyond engaging the humans on the ground to figure out in a really authentic way what those barriers are, and then solutioning afterwards and, and bringing it to life. And speaking of the, of the solutioning, when we first chatted, you shared some interesting insight on the hype versus the concerns around artificial intelligence. So what's your personal take on that? I actually think that if we look at like the hype cycle around machine learning and AI, we are starting to hit, I, I hope, the pinnacle of the hype and, and a bit of a plateau. And what I mean by that is, you know, even three, four years ago, there was a ton of excitement and hype around um, what machine learning is going to be able to do. But as we're starting to build our, what I'll call like AI literacy into the health AI space, both from like a clinician and nursing perspective and upskilling people to understand AI literacy in the clinical domain, but also as technical innovators working in this space, we're really starting to anchor now on projects that are very feasible, things that we're deploying today um, and where we're able to leverage machine learning in a really powerful way to improve throughput through the emergency department, to improve patient safety at scale. And so I think we're starting to move beyond the hype as the technologies are quite literally being deployed. And um, I'm so proud of the role that Hero AI has had at SickKids and helping to enable both the technology development and the deployment of these tools. Since you mentioned, um, you, know, you brought it up at the beginning, and I, that's, I'm happy you brought it up again just now. Uh, for our listeners, um, tell just kind of tell, walk us through what Hero AI is and, and what solution you're aiming to solve. Uh, so Hero AI is this healthcare technology company that sort of spun out of SickKids um, as we identified this need to have a platform that was super agile to be able to deploy these um, machine learning models into production. And I guess at a high level, um, you could sort of think of us as the automation layer for your healthcare institution. And so what do I mean by that? Well, we actually can take any type of electronic health record data in real time. And so we stream, right now, we stream electronic health record data um, out of the emergency department in real time. And then we're able to talk to the institution and say, okay, now that we have this data coming to us, where are the areas where you want to see improvement and process improvement or improved uh, patient safety? Or where are there challenges that you want to target? Um, and then once we understand what a particular challenge is, we very quickly, like in a matter of 
hours to days, quite literally, can model a solution that then integrates into a, a pipeline and a platform that then deploys automation into a workflow. And that could look like um, automated alerts being sent to um, a healthcare provider. It could look like um, an actual dashboard or alerts that are even patient facing. And right now we're actually working on building an integration to autonomous bots. Uh, it could look like an automation um, that triggers a bot to go collect a patient and move them from point A to point B uh, in an efficient way. And so really, we're uh, focused on bringing to life real-time data and powering automated downstream aspects of care. Uh, I can give you one example to make yeah. it more concrete because that almost sounds a bit abstract. <laughs> in a sense, yes, I was right? about to ask you that. Yeah, give us an example. Yeah, and, and so uh, right now, we have a tool deployed in, in the emergency department called the Beacon app. And so the Beacon app is a mobile app device that our providers have on the ground. Um, Some nurses, our physicians, uh, and even some um, sub-specialty consults. And so we realized that there was a problem with uh, kiddos who have presented with acute mental health crisis were just waiting really long throughout the pandemic um, to receive the care that they needed. And just like empathize with that scenario for a second. Imagine you're a parent or you're an adolescent, you're going through an acute mental health crisis. Maybe it's the first time you're experiencing this. And then you're sitting in a waiting room waiting for many, many hours to then be seen and to receive your care. It just like... Um, it must be like the worst experience for that patient to be sitting there in distress uh, in a chair waiting. And so we knew that we needed to tackle this um, head on. And so now thinking about what we do in this platform, we can take that real time triage data as it gets created, uh, identify that there's a patient who's just arrived in an acute mental health crisis. And then our models can recognize that and then automate the notification to psychiatry on call, which allows psychiatry to receive an, a simple notification um, through the Beacon app provided by Hero AI. And it brings psychiatry down to see that patient even before the emergency doctor has seen the patient. What does that mean? It means that that kiddo is getting care now um, much faster than what they were before when they had to wait for the ED doc and then get the consult going in. And from a numbers perspective, we've now been able to um, reduce the time that a, an acute mental health patient is sitting waiting on average when our alerts fire um, to less than 90 minutes from the time that they arrive to that they're being seen by our, our psychiatry support services and support team. And it also is translated to almost a two-hour reduction in the length of stay of that acute mental health patient sitting waiting. Mm -hmm. Um, and and spent in the ED. So not only are they getting care faster, but we're freeing up space in the emergency department to then see other patients faster. And it's through just this simple intervention of using basic machine learning modeling and and AI techniques and automating an aspect of downstream care is driving like a really massive improvement. And so that example could ripple to so many different things. Like if an institution is struggling with maybe patients who have transplant end up waiting too long, or maybe patients with acute surgical conditions they find are waiting too long for a particular aspect of care, we can look at that data, add automation to it, and really drive um, care improvements. And that's what HeroEI is all about. Wow, that's fantastic. The story you told is, um, yeah, just it just opened my eyes. So out of all, I can hear the passion in your voice and out of all this, what's, I guess, you know, I'm sure there's many lessons, but what's one lesson that kind of like pops to the surface that really helped you along this journey that you're like, oh, that's, you know what, this, when we did this or did, you know, did this, I really, the team and I really learned um, some valuable, you know, aha moment from this. Was was there a a moment like that for you? There was actually, because when you start your journey into machine learning and AI, and and I'm hoping there's a lot of clinicians and health leaders who are going to listen to this, who are excited to jump in to AI, um, because we need that and we need to upskill the health workforce with AI literacy. But when I started that journey, it's naturally like the process, you're thinking technical, right? You're like, I'm learning how to code. I'm learning how to critically appraise machine learning models. And I'm working with data and you're sitting in front of a screen. Um, and you have to make sure that you don't lose sight of the reason why you're sitting in front of this screen and building this model and this code. It's for a human. It's, it's for your patient, right? And, you know, these cases that I kept close to my heart were always the North Star to help me understand, like, 
is what we're building actually the right thing for that kiddo? Would it have solved that particular case? Mm -hmm. Um, And so I guess the lesson that I'm saying here is that although there's so much cool technology that's evolving, the technology isn't the most important part. It actually is about the humans and it's about the workflow that is being adopted and enabled by the technology. And so the way you solve the problem has to be um, sort of fueled by a design methodology, by deep stakeholder engagement. You have to validate your assumptions around the problem and make sure that you're really using the technology to solve a real world human problem in the right way. But then also on the other end of the pipeline, the way you then deploy your technology is 100% dependent on humans in the workflow, Mm -hmm. right? Like getting like um, adoption and the change management and making sure the workflow is actually the right one and building in aspects of iteration as part of the deployment that knowing that I'm going to deploy something and I'm not going to assume that it's going to be perfect right at the get-go. Like we're building into that process, real stakeholder engagement with nurses, clinicians, patients, and families so that we adopt the and, and um, change the technology in a rapidly iterative way is, is the most important part to all of this. And imagine like you're building a, a tech company. I'm learning computer science. Um, temporarily, you're disconnected from, from that reality And it's when we started to think through deploying an impact, we realized the real lesson here that uh, I would encourage everyone to keep close is that this is really about human workflows, improving human workflows and lives. uh, And you can't lose sight of that because if you do, you'll develop the wrong thing and your technology won't be adopted. I'm so happy uh, you brought up the the human aspect. And so, you know, we at Heroc and our subscribers all across the country, you know, we're all in a mission to turn, you know, the corner on patient safety. And and so you just, just rightly so brought up the fact that, you know, these efficiencies, uh, yes, they're created with the use of technology, but um, how do they link with the patient perspective or what feedback have you received on how safety is addressed? This is a really great question. And so both with my Sick Kids hat on and with my Hero AI hat on, and the two worlds can sometimes overlap in, in a cool way, um, we, we've we engaged with families and patients. And so what we wanted to understand was uh, what were the concerns that families had while sitting and waiting? Mm-hmm. And of course, like one of the root causes of parent and patient anxiety when waiting is them thinking that... Um, are they going to experience harm because of that weight? So that was one thing. Um, and then also another um, thing that ran through as we interviewed families um, in the waiting room was around there's like a deep sense of anxiety related to not knowing what's happening. Yeah. Like when, when you check into the emergency department and then you sit in this chair and now you're going to sit there for like four plus hours with no idea on what's happening. Like, were you skipped over? Are you actually getting closer to being seen? How long is the wait time going to be? Where are you at in the queue? And we we even had some families um, give feedback saying they were scared to um, get up and go and use the washroom because they didn't want to be skipped over. Yeah. So just then, like, we, we love to empathize, and we, we create, um, at Hero, we create these, like, empathy maps and to understand, like, what's actually happening. And I'm just sitting there thinking, like, okay, if I had to pee really, really badly, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm also worried about my care, and I don't want to go because I don't yeah. want to be skipped over, like, just think of how terrible of an experience that is. Right. And so when we start to then build in tools... Um, to address that, like we we have a patient facing application um, that shows um, families where they're at in their queue, what might their wait times be. We automate um, notifications to families so they can build their health literacy based on the reasons why they're presenting, um, and we try to address that sort of head on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the main thing that actually rang through though as like a cautionary tale from families was that. They love the idea of using tools to make them in the loop and more situationally aware. They love that um, the idea that maybe even automation could get them seen faster, but they didn't want technology to equate to less human interactivity and less mm-hmm. human facing time, yeah. right? They, they didn't want the richness of that encounter with their provider to be replaced. And so that's one of the things that we're starting to balance here is that 
really, when you look at the the solutions we've deployed at SickKids Hospital, it's really about connecting you to the right person faster. It's about identifying when there might be a latent safety issue rising in a period of prolonged wait times and making sure they don't happen. But it's not about replacing the the quality and the, the time that you spend with our human providers. And I, I think that's really important. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I obviously ask um, about the, when you talk, you talk um, a lot about the patient perspective, but what about your colleagues? How, how have they taken to the technology? It's a really good question. And I'm, I'm just kind of laughing because I'm thinking about it from the eMERGE doc in me. The last thing an emergency doctor wants is another alert about something <laughs> that is not relevant to them. Yeah. Right. And so uh, you have to be really like one of the lessons we've learned is you have to be really thoughtful about w- who you're alerting and when you're alerting them. And is there actually like an expected workflow um, paired with that alert for that specific provider? Right. Mm-hmm. And so and and we kind of experimented with this. Like we had a set of alerts when we initially deployed a few years ago. They just kind of like alerted went out into the ether they, they weren't related to patient safety but more like logistics and flow yeah um, and we were we were just tracking like who's engaging and why are they engaging and what alerts do people just naturally engage with versus don't um and, and we monitor mm-hmm. that all through the platform and it gave us a really good idea around what just at a baseline might be useful or not but the most important thing that started to drive the impact particularly around the mental health use case that i described was it's paired with like a workflow that is co-designed by those providers, right? That's what's key about this. Um, Emergency doctors and nurses, the last thing they need is an alert or some sort of interruption that they don't need to know about, right? And so that's what we're really focusing on um, right now is then starting to pair formal workflows uh, and alerting the right provider at the right time for the right scenarios. It's really cool. And, um, you know, we're all about co-design too. So that's, I love that you brought that up. And and so, I don't know, you don't have to give a full story on it, but your co-design process working with the providers, is it like, do you have like a committee? Is it a council? Is it, do you have um, key advisors you go to or people who just volunteer? How does that work? It's a mix of all of that, actually. Oh, so okay. we have like quality practice committees on the sick kids side um, that are both from the departmental perspective in the eMERGE, but also like an institutional wide perspective and um, and patient and family representatives as well that do oh. a lot of great volunteer work at sick kids. Um, again, both like patient and family reps um, in the emergency department as part of those committees, but also across like the institution as a whole. Um, and so sick kids has been really um, forward thinking and having those types of committees already in place. And so what's been such a a cool opportunity for us is as we're conceptualizing novel machine learning projects or even like thinking through um, here's here's a potential front-end interface through an app, is this useful, yes or no? Um, We've been able to take that to these committees and get really great feedback. Like one of the things that um, we we didn't appreciate uh, just like a lesson learned from uh, as an example of going to one of these committees is that families don't really understand triage at all. Um, And I thought this was interesting because we had some language that used the word triage and it would um, be facing a patient immediately after they finished triage. (laughs) We we started talking to families about um, triage in the waiting room and they were like, what's triage? I was like, oh, (laughs) that's that's a process you just did. Oh, I didn't know that was triage. And so this like co-design, this engagement really is so valuable because you then start to realize that a lot of the assumptions you're making um, could be false. Uh, and it's, it's helped us build like a, a really high quality um, patient facing product. Another thing I'm absolutely great for you just brought up is the fact that, um, you know, the words we use, they matter so much. And in healthcare, yeah. sometimes we use acronyms or we use uh, words that someone may not understand, you know, the, the, whoever your audience is may not, may not get it. Sometimes they may not ask, they may not say, Oh, can you please explain? Like, you know, they, you know, fear of shame or whatever they, they feel, um, they just feel, just feel unsure of themselves, et cetera. And then that can lead to further <laughs> complications on the road. But I love the fact that you brought up that, you know, clear communication and, you know, using words that, you know, the, that patients use and using words that providers use is, is will be beneficial to all, all involved. 
And the way you you do that, like if if your listeners are thinking through like, okay, well, how do you actually operationalize that type of engagement? Again, it really goes back to design methodology and like design methodology for health. And so I've been so lucky to uh, be able to work alongside um, Dr. Sasha Litwin. She is an incredible emergency doctor here at SickKids, but she also has a master's from OCAD, University of All Places, wow. in design methodology. So super unique skill set to have. Uh, and so she helps to bring to life these really rich engagements um, that bridge the gap between the technology, the assumptions that we make around the problem we think we're supposed to solve and how we're going to solve it. And then that stakeholder engagement that then helps us validate the assumptions. And I'll tell you, like the assumptions are, are often wrong. Like even as the eMERGE provider, you're like, well, I live and breathe this problem. I must know like uh, what the other um, stakeholders will think about it, but you actually don't. And so these design methodology frameworks and and exercises are so valuable to making sure you get the the solution right. Uh, and ultimately, it may seem like more front end effort, but it leads to um, more success when you get to the, to the uh, deployment phase. That's fantastic. And before I have, I think I have one more question before I pass it over to my colleague Abby. But you're super passionate. I can hear again. I, I can hear your voice about healthcare professionals stepping into the role of of being an entrepreneur at their organization. And so, I guess, um, what advice would you give to other healthcare leaders listening today on how they can, you know, uh, harness their knowledge, but also bring in their, you know, also bring in their passion to drive change uh, and innovation at their organization? Yeah, it's a really good question because when you're trying to, um, either you're an entrepreneur or intrapreneur, if you're in that space, it means that you are creating something that probably doesn't exist anywhere widely. And so it means that it's like a net new um, idea or solution or product that you're trying to develop. And anytime you're trying to do something for the first time, you're going to face a lot of friction. And so sometimes people can think that, um, well, there's too much friction here. That's a bad thing. But anytime I'm going to a new institution and deploying something and then suddenly there's like, you know, a lot of people are getting involved and like, wait a minute, wait a minute, like slow down. Like, what are we doing? It actually means that we're, we're, we're breaking ground in yes. something new. And that's actually quite exciting. So I think the first piece of advice would be don't let the, what feels like brick walls you run into again and again early on in the journey actually um, feel like these are reasons to not continue. Yeah. Right. Um, they're actually uh, exciting opportunities to break ground on something that's totally new and novel. And you'll be surprised, like a few years later, you'll look back and you'll you'll have laid a groundwork for others to follow. And you also um, will likely have created something that's novel, new and exciting. And that's really the story of Hero AI. Like it was a journey to get going initially. Yeah. And it felt like you're meeting with everybody under the sun across the institution. Um, but that engagement is leading to downstream efficiencies now, like as we're deploying and accelerating forward. And so I, I would um, just say to your viewers or your listeners, uh, take those roadblocks and pieces of friction as like validation that you are doing something new and just surge forward and just break through them. Uh, it will be really exciting um, on the other side. And I'm also happy you brought up the point about, you know, when something like is very different comes to an organization, everybody is true. Everyone does kind of gravitate to, they want to be involved in it. And they, and some of them may want to be involved to like find holes and some of them may want to be involved in it to, um, you know, help and support it. And, and I think it, you kind of brought that, hit the point about, you know, like it's, it, you have this captive audience you know, keep at it with this group, the, the naysayers yeah. and the supporters. <laughs> yeah, you actually early on in the entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial journey, or, or even if it's just an innovation journey, you want to find the people who are going to say no quickly. Yeah. Don't let them like sort of take the wind out of your sail, but <laughs> it means that they represent a really different opinion or a potential landmine or roadblock down the road. So mm -hmm. I love like finding people who will say no very, very quickly, understanding their perspective and yes. then working um, with them to get over those roadblocks um, early on in the project. 
And so th- these these are positive things to find, right? Like someone who is like, wait a minute, no, I don't think we can do that. That's not necessarily someone who's not supportive, but it's an opportunity for you to understand and tackle um, this situation. Because if you really are going to scale to other hospitals, you're going to get the same person again and again. So it's actually like a blessing and an opportunity to figure out how to solve it now versus down the road when you're looking to scale and you've already put in all this investment. Absolutely. Abby just pinged me. So Abby, you have some questions too for Devin, right? I do. Hi, Devin. It's great to meet you. Uh, You touched on the mission and impact of Hero AI thus far. So I'm wondering what's next? What's next for you and Hero AI? Yeah, so uh, we've had some really great and powerful impact in at Sickens in the Emerge. And honestly, we're just the tip of the iceberg in the emergency department at Sickens. Uh, I'm really excited for this year on the the new workflows that we'll be deploying uh, into the ED at Sickens and um, just how powerful that's going to be. But we're now at this awesome stage where we're starting to scale out to other sites. And so we're looking to scale across Canada. We're having really great um, conversations uh, with health authorities in multiple provinces looking to do deployments and to really um, spread this positive impact widely across Canada. We also um, are looking to international opportunities. And so we were selected by um, the UK Trade Commissioner's Office or um, import um, uh, side of the UK government as a potential company that uh, should be imported into the UK and as a promising AI company. And so we just finished a tour through the UK, which was amazing, like just such a great time. Time, um, and had recognized that there's a lot of synergy to be had between how we solve problems in Canada and the set of problems that emergency departments are facing in the UK as well. And so we're going to look towards scaling across both Canada and the UK together and try to bring these shared innovations and lessons across both um, so that we're really elevating the way we deliver care both across the UK and Canada. And then, of course, um, into the U.S. represents a really great opportunity for the company. That sounds amazing. And we wish you all the best in what's to come next, Evan. And you touched on Thank traveling you. to the UK recently, which actually leads me to my next question. So you travel to Scotland and London on behalf of your company, Hero AI. So what value do you find in attending events and networking internationally? I wasn't sure what to expect, to be honest. And this was just incredible. So in Scotland, um, particularly in Edinburgh, we found that the University of Edinburgh has an incredible AI hub, Um, really deep expertise on robotics, um, really great programs as it relates to the development of novel machine learning models and algorithms. And I think like the value of me physically going there and just seeing it, it, it was starting to open my eyes to realize that there are really awesome opportunities for our health systems in Canada to be collaborating with places like Scotland. Scotland. Um, I was also super impressed by um, both London and in particular uh, Cambridge University. Cambridge, um, you know, obviously world renowned, but around technology and health tech has an incredibly powerful ecosystem where I think there's opportunities for our academic centers to share around learnings or on how they approach innovation um, and sustainability. And so um, those are conversations that I'm brokering right now. And uh, there's uh, really exciting times on the Hero AI front. Um, and hopefully we'll be making some big announcements about our opportunities in the UK. You made great points because every new environment and space has new people and new perspective, which in turn helps you grow. And that's so important. And uh, speaking of growth, who do you look to for inspiration and motivation? And this can be anyone in healthcare or even or even outside of healthcare. One of the things that uh, I find really inspiring, and this has nothing to do with healthcare, but just in the sports, um, I'm a huge sports fan. And when I think about, um, I'm pretty into like reading bios and just understanding people's journeys. And I always find that in the athletics or in the sports space, um, you know, it's, it's surprising to see how much failure someone has to go through in order to become great. Right. And so that's something that I've really taken to heart around this idea of truly promoting a fail fast, fail safe culture and the way we think about the deployment of our technologies and strategically planning to fail in certain spaces such that you aren't actually creating harms like fail ahead of time. Like imagine if I owned a rocket company and you've seen this with SpaceX, those rockets will blow up time and time again. But when someone's physically on the rocket, 
uh, knock on wood, hopefully this doesn't ever happen, but the rocket doesn't blow up. And I think that that happens uh, because of this idea of being open to failing early, learning lessons from those failures, and, and promoting that to actually happen quickly um, and efficiently such that when you do launch something, it's a huge success. And I think that that's a, a really important lesson in the tech space, um, particularly as it relates to healthcare, when stakes can be high, when you bring something into production. But it's something that I, I first gained exposure to from just sports and following people's journeys um, and, and professional athletes, and that the mentality they bring to success is one that understands that failure is part of the journey. Uh, and they quite quite frankly, embrace it. Yeah, I appreciate that you would draw inspiration from something actually so far for removed from healthcare. And it really does go to show that inspiration is really all around us. And with you working as a doctor and on with Hero AI and sitting on boards, it definitely sounds like you're a go-getter who is constantly motivated. And you touched on your love of sports. Um, you were on the board of directors at Special Olympics Ontario. So tell us a bit about what this organization means to you and why you decided to join. That was a great segue, Abby, um, <laughs> to, to Special Olympics. That's cool. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I love sports, and so Special Olympics was a great fit. But um, I'm going to talk a bit selfishly, actually, or not necessarily what Special Olympics is getting from me, but what I get from Special Olympics. Um, and when I work in the emergency department, uh, I see kids um, sometimes when they're in their sickest moments, right? Like they need help, they need care. Uh, and I love being able to provide that care, both medically, but also just that that personal touch with families. Um, and, and it's super rewarding. But what I rarely get to see when I work at Sick Kids, especially as an emergency doctor, is when these patients are thriving at their best. Right. And so when I go to these special Olympics events and, and I go to the different games that they host and I quite literally see these kids, um, and the, these, um, adults like truly thriving at their best, competing in sport, um, and just the joy that that brings, uh, to them. I don't, I don't think people understand how much joy that brings to me as well. It gives like this full circle purpose to the really hard work that I do in the emergency department as a clinician, seeing that those efforts do ripple into our patients truly thriving. Um, and that's something that I think about and anchor to when it's four in the morning and there's lots of patients to see and I'm working really, really hard. Um, so I actually think Special Olympics, um, being on the board of directors, has given way more back to me than I could ever give to them for that alone. But one of the things I am trying to give to them is around leveraging machine learning, AI, and technology uh, to improve the way we promote health promotion amongst all of the athletes. And so just earlier today, I had an incredible meeting um, with folks across the Special Olympics organization, and we're thinking through how do we leverage um, uh, mobile apps that Hero AI has built um, and pairing that with generative AI tools to make health promotion far more accessible to our athletes across the globe. And so that's it's a project that I think is going to have a massive impact. And, and quite frankly, like we were just mapping out what this is going to look like. And I think it's going to leapfrog most companies in, in how, how awesome and innovative this tool is going to be uh, once we develop it. And so um, that, that's one of the ways that I'm trying to give back my, uh, my sort of technical expertise back to Special Olympics. I love that answer. And this definitely seems like a breath of fresh air and a factor of motivation for um, your career. And as I mentioned before, it's so interesting to see you sit on an organization that isn't directly healthcare or medical re related. And it really does show how wide your passions and your interests are. And speaking of wide passions, after you became a doctor, you completed a master's degree in computer science and artificial intelligence. So what's one piece of advice you would give to professionals on taking that leap to follow multiple passions and continue their education? I think the advice uh, that I would give is that it's actually really hard up front, but the reward afterwards uh, is incredible. Like it's totally worth the effort. Like if you're a practicing clinician 
And now you're thinking about upskilling or building a new skill in a totally different domain. It's a lot of work. Like you're managing your schedule, uh, which is already pretty demanding if you're working in the healthcare space. And and you're trying to think through how am I going to have both the time capacity, the mental capacity, um, and then even like the family support side of things to then take this effort and time and energy and channel it towards something else. And so uh, it could be a lot of work up front and the barriers to entry might seem really high. But now that I'm through it on the other side, it is honestly the best thing I've done in my career. Like being able uh, to have this skill set and sit in between these two worlds and to, it almost feels like this superpower I have sometimes to innovate and to help improve the way we deliver care is just such an honor and a blessing. Um, and I'm really glad I, I took the advice of my, my um, division head of Emerge, actually, Dr. Jason Fisher. I remember clearly sitting down and asking him, should I go into this internship, into a tech company, and just try to be super applied? Or should I go through um, this path of formally doing a master's in computer science, knowing that it's going to be super painful? Um, It was actually an amazing journey, but like, you know, it's hard, right? You're working as a doctor and then doing a master's in computer science, of all things. And um, he, he told me, you know, no one can ever take away education from you. And it is uh, a skill that I don't think you understand how important and how powerful it will be for you down the road. And that piece of advice stuck with me. I acted on it and I am so grateful that I did. Thank you for that advice. It definitely resonated with me, especially that point about no one can take education away from you and factoring in risk versus reward with every big decision that you make. And I appreciate you being so honest about how how hard it may be um, to balance everything. So I'm sure our listeners will appreciate and resonate with that advice. We have a few lightning round questions for you. And you can answer them with one word, a, a sentence, whatever you, whatever, however you feel. Uh, so what okay. was your first job ever? Okay, so in the same week, I got hired by two different places, and then I, I worked them. Oh. Uh, funny story, my big sister actually applied to both of them on my behalf. It was the <laughs> YMCA, oh. <laughs> working at working um, as a camp counselor at the YMCA, and um, working at the Gap. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> just randomly an awesome uh, a salesman for jeans at the Gap. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about your definition of a perfect day. Sitting by the water with the sun shining and then having day transition into like a starry night, uh, being surrounded by a fire with my family. That is my perfect day. That is nice. And then it's already sunny outside. So hopefully if you're you're not working today, then you can uh, start that. (laughs) Yeah, that's the plan. Finish the sentence. Um, If I wasn't in healthcare, I'd probably be doing... I would want to be a famous movie director. That was my other career path that I was thinking of going down uh, before uh, deciding to go into medicine. So I was super into film and media production. And, uh, you know, maybe I could have been holding an Oscar this past Sunday. Who knows? Right? Do you have any advice on managing your time? Like, Do you have any apps or ha- hacks you do to save time? It's something I think about often. Um, I guess the quick advice would be if you can act and get something done and out of the way super fast, just do it. Like yeah. if you thought about it, just like execute on it immediately and get it out of your pipeline. And then honestly, like uh, my biggest supporter is my wife, uh, Sarah. So we tackle this together. So we are a, a team. She helps manage the logistics and the operations. And even though I wear three different hats, she makes it feel like one. And so Aww. I know that's not advice for uh, people because <laughs> you, I mean, you, you can't have Sarah. She's mine. Yeah, but um but it, it is, you know, just a nod to say that um, the support you get from your family can be hugely helpful. That is good advice, leaning on leaning on the supports in your life. Um, and my last question for you, if you could have lunch with anyone in the world, famous or not, who would you want to have lunch with? Michael Jordan. He's my childhood hero. This was such a, a fantastic conversation. And it, I, it was so good that we went over time. But we want to thank you so much for Devin for chatting with us. We really appreciate this. Yeah, thanks, Philip and Abby, for having me join. This was such a pleasure, and uh, I hope your listeners get something out of it. Thank you for listening. You can hear more episodes of Healthcare Changemakers on our website, heroc.com, and on your favorite podcasting apps. If you like what you hear, please rate us or post a review. Healthcare Changemakers is recorded by Heroc's communications and marketing team. 
and produced by Podfly Productions. Follow us on Twitter at at HEROC Group or email us at communications at HEROC.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you.